he speak through my dad today and tell us what we need to hear. We use him to pray. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Last week we talked about hell as a destination for some people, right? <laughs> we talked a little bit about what it was going to be like. We talked a little bit about what can get us there or get people there. False religions and such. We talked about how the things of this earth aren't really things that we should put before God. We're going to jump right into... The scripture, let me turn off some more lights up. <coughs> Seems like the north wind's got everybody's mouth just dry. Can you hear me in the back? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> So I'm going to break in Gus's bite before I give it to him. So I'm reading out of there. 619. We're reading out of NLT today. So. 619. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. And where thieves break in and steal Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal wherever your treasure is. There the desires of your heart will also be. <clears throat> your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light, but when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. Don't they, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at all the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Many of us have already read this, have heard it, have studied it. Now is when Joel Austin will say, now just give me your credit card number and I will fill your treasures in heaven for you. <laughs> it is what we Christians listen to when we're kind. It is what false teachers use to get you to open up your pocketbook more. Can we, do we have too much? Yeah. We're eating bread in church drinking coffee with three different kinds of coffee flavoring. I mean, these are first world problems, right? <laughs> Everybody has their cell phone turned off, right? We're recording this on iPads. We're complaining about our projectors. So, this, I 
I'm not downplaying this. This is for us. What I am warning against is the false teachers of this verse. Be careful. But I do want to cover the actual reading. One thing I noticed is that I stress more about the money I'm spending beyond the things that I need. God gave me enough, gave us enough money to pay for all of our bills. I don't stress about that. When the mortgage is due, we pay the mortgage. When, the, when we need to go buy food to feed the kids, we go buy food to feed the kids. When we need to go buy food to feed the animals, we go feed the animals. But after it's all said and done, then we're like, hey, we have a little bit. What should we do? Now the stress begins. It's like, hey, let's take the kids out for a treat. Well, when I was young, a treat was Taco Bell or McDonald's. And we didn't go there very often. Little League just started. Talk about McDonald's are going to be well known to us. Hopefully not. We're planning on that. But in the past it has been. Money causes a lot of stress. If you don't have money, you're stressed out. <coughs> If you have too much money, you're worried about spending it so you don't have to pay it to the government. Right? <laughs> I mean, unless you're like in the middle of your sleep. You know, our government could use a little, a little blessing. I'm going to send them some extra cash. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of sleep over this? <laughs> We need to not be stingy, right? God has blessed us. We need to bless. Our works that we do on earth, the way we behave with our money, the way we behave with our time is the blessing that we're storing up in heaven. We're not putting a down payment on our house in heaven. So you're not writing a check for your down payment on your mansion in heaven. On your house in heaven, you need to be in a relationship with God and say, it's between you and him and say, yes, God, you've given me everything I need. You're right. You said that. And it happens. We've come up short on money before. But yet, here we are. God provided Next slide, please. Matthew 19. <coughs> we'll go 16 through 30. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which one? the man asked. We're always trying to bargain, guys. And Jesus replied, You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Command that I've obeyed all these commandments. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Then Peter said to him, We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on twelve thrones. Judging the twelve tribes of Israel and everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. And Joel Austin would say, take your credit card. <laughs> I remember there was these, these, I don't know what you'd call them, prophets they called themselves or something, that they knew when the world was going to end. And there were people doing this. He was using this. And they went and they sold their house and they sold their car and they sold everything and they gave it to him. And that day came and went. And they can't recall that gift that they gave to him, but they gave it. And this guy kept it. Turned into a rich man overnight. <coughs> these verses, these teachings by Jesus ha yes it has it's talking about money but it's talking about our heart's desire the rich man loved his money if you love your time if you love drugs if you love girls he's asking you to give that stuff up and put him first Poor people don't have to worry about having too much money. So they... It's easy. It's easier for them to give and understand God's love because God has provided. Because God... He's talking about a humble person. That's not saying that we aren't humble. Or that you are not humble. We work on humility. If you say you're humble, Moses did it, but I don't say that I'm a humble person. I say that I try to be humble or I'm working at being humble. Just like I, I don't like calling myself a Christian. I say I'm a practicing Christian. I'm working on it. Next slide, please. We've read this now, I think, like four weeks in a row or five weeks in a row. Same book. Different verses in correlation with other verses. So John 14, 8 through 15. I needed answers, and that's why we're going through all of these. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. 
Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I need a million bucks. I need a million bucks. Right? Somebody's going to take this and flip it. Some preacher some is somewhere in the church where they're not following God and they're going to take this and they're going to say, you can ask for anything. Next slide. A little bit more reading. James chapter 2. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there, or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments aren't guided by evil or are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is guilty as a person who has broken all of God's law. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, Goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, <coughs> faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is deeds and useless. It is dead. Thank you. It is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that, the, that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. 
He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she did, or when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without works. And there is the relationship. There is the tithing. There is what you give to God and how you're supposed to, to give. Abraham had a lot. A lot of things. God didn't ask him for all those things. God promised him a son, and he gave him a son. And then God said, give me back that son. God could have asked him for his riches. He could have asked him, hey, open up your wallet, open up your pocketbook, give that to me. God wants you to put God first. The tithe. The tithe is an, is an interesting We're playing this game. It's like the entire youth group. Right? We're playing this video game on our phones. It's called Hey. And I was talking to somebody about this or we were talking about tithing. And people have put bad names on tithing with certain churches because anyway <coughs> but I said no I said with God what it is is he wants the first 10% and, and when you look at hay day basically you have these land plots and you plant hay or other things so I was able to go to that and I said no you would give him the first 10% the rest of it is yours 90% of every God gave you 100 you get to keep 90. He's asking you out of obedience to give him a 10 from the front before you give it to everybody else. What that means, what that does, is it allows you to be poor and give a 10. When you have a lot, somebody needs to clothe the naked. Somebody needs to feed the hungry. If everybody has given away everything, everybody is poor. Where did it go? So the church is going to be rich? Our neighbors, we give to our neighbors. We give and God's asking you not to hold that money so close but know also also how to bless the people here. You're not buying real estate in heaven. That has to do with your relationship, not your pocketbook. <clears throat> Giving money without believing in what you're giving it to, without being a true follower, don't do it. Don't come to church, don't go to church, don't come to church and give your tithe like you're paying for your seat. Tithing is a relationship between you and God, not you and the pastor. <clears throat> So going to, back to last week, how did this tie in? These are the verses, not this one, but the verses that we read a little bit ago are what they're using to become rich. 
Joel Austin, I think, is a billionaire. <coughs> he sells some devil worshipping books, but I don't think it's coming from there. So we are running away from hell. And we are telling people, we're praying about people, we're preparing, trying to talk to people who don't know God. Because we're worried about hell. And one of the things is we need to make sure that they're running towards God and towards God's arms and not towards a church or somebody online that's going to lead them right away from hell and right into Satan's arms. <coughs> Running away from something is pretty easy. Running into God is where we need to lead people. You know, something is scary, we're going to run away from it. We kind of found that out when we went camping, right? There's a big old bear. Nobody wanted to go mess with that bear. We made sure and stayed away from that bear. Buddy kind of went towards the bear. Well, Buddy did go towards the bear. <laughs> he says, I've been real close to hell. This bear is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground, in the cloud and in the sea. All of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as, as some of them did. I'm going to pause right there. So I'm in the middle of verse 7. When you're talking to unbelievers, I mean... Uh, some of them will say, or you would think, man, if you could just witness a miracle, you would believe as I do. I've, ha I've seen miracles happen. I was a horrible person. God saved me. God, you guys sang the songs. Man, I love it when Buddy sings the songs that tie in with my sermon. I wrote it down because I have a really bad memory. It says, I will never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Like Charlie Aldridge in his testimony. These people that walked in the wilderness saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And even after all those miracles, they were still worshiping idols. Where were we? Seven. So I need to start bringing my reading glasses to Sunday. That's or worship idols as some of them did, as the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality, as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us.
they were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. And now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and re reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. When you, if you know of anybody who is going to the wrong church and are being told to go broke and give to the church, it's interesting that when it talks about the three things that live forever in that same chapter, it talks about don't sell everything because then you're going to boast about it. In that same Chapter, it talks about being able to have a relationship and serve God with everything He gave you. If you quit giving to the church, we will have to shut the doors and turn off the lights. It should be about your relationship with God. Not your relationship with the pastor or the building or anything else. God has given to you, give it back to him, the tenth. And then all of a sudden you'll see you'll be giving more. One day you have, you'll have no idea how much you gave. You just do it. Until tax season.
<laughs> Father God, Lord, we give thanks and praise, Lord. We love you. We want to be obedient. We understand that everything that we have, not just our money, but our family, this church, this church family, the things that this little town of Gridley offers is a blessing by you. We want to be more obedient. We give thanks to every single blessing you give us. Bless this church. Lead this church, Lord. Speak to this church, Lord. Grow this church, Lord. We ask for this in your name. We ask that you would grow this church, make us more mature. Lead us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. For those that would like to stay for the congregational meeting, you are welcome.